So this video is a summary of Edexcel IAL materials and the first topic is looking at density. And this density, which we use the letter rho for, is equal to the mass per unit volume. And normally we measure mass in kilograms and our volume in cubic metres. And in terms of the volume, it's just worth remembering um, the, how to calculate the volume of certain shapes. These come up all the time. So we're thinking about things like cylinders and spheres. So for a cylinder, it's going to be pi r squared times the length, or the height of that cylinder. And for a sphere, it's going to be equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. So these ones here, these come up all the time. But again, when we're looking at the density of objects in kilograms per cubic metre, it's just worth remembering some of these common shapes. Now the next thing in this topic is looking at a force called upthrust. So imagine we had an object which was submerged in a fluid, uh, perhaps we had some water here uh, and this thing was floating in it, then there's going to be an upwards force and the size of this force is going to be related to the weight of fluid displaced. And this is providing a buoyancy force in the upwards direction. We might also have maybe an object which is completely submerged and then we're going to have this object here. It's got a weight force acting down, but the upthrust is going to be equal to the weight of fluid displaced by this object. And this then leads nicely on to what happens if you had an object which is falling or moving through a fluid. What are the size of the forces involved? And this is where we come on to Stokes' law. So perhaps we had a ball bearing falling through some liquid, which is a fluid. What's going to be affecting the drag force on that? Well, the drag force depends upon a number of factors. It depends upon the viscosity of that liquid, which we've got this symbol here for, which is the Greek letter eta. It depends upon how big this ball bearing is, so I'm going to put in an R for the radius of this ball, and also how quickly it's moving its velocity v. In actual fact, there's also a 6 pi in there, and this is the relationship they found when they did some experimentation. So let's just look at some of these factors in a little bit more detail. This eta here, this Greek letter, is the viscosity. So this viscosity is really a measure of the stickiness of the liquid. Something like thick oil is going to be a lot more viscous than something like water. And Stokes' law, it really applies to spherical objects. We're looking at things which are travelling at a relatively low velocity. And also what we have is laminar flow. And when we're talking about laminar flow, we're thinking about uh, things moving um, in an ordered way in that fluid, as opposed to turbulent flow, which is actually really kind of difficult to model and actually try and fit any equations to. So we're looking at laminar flow and not turbulent flow. And finally, the viscosity of the liquid also depends on temperature. Often when something is warmed up, its viscosity decreases. So let's imagine we had a ball bearing and maybe we've dropped it through a fluid. Uh, so this is a ball bearing over here. There are going to be some forces acting on it. There's going to be a force acting down due to the weight of that object. There's going to be a drag force acting against it. And we can work out the size of that drag force using Stokes' law. So this F here is going to be the drag force. And there's also going to be the upthrust acting on that object which is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. And this is where we come on to one of the core practicals. And in core practical two, what you can do is you can actually measure the viscosity of a liquid. And we do this by dropping a ball bearing through a fluid and letting it get to its terminal velocity. Now at its terminal velocity, there's going to be no resultant force on that object. And that means the weight force acting down is going to be equal to the drag force plus the upthrust. Now we can calculate the weight uh, from the mass of the object times the gravitational field strength, so weight equals mg. The upthrust is going to be equal to the weight of fluid displaced, and we can calculate this if we know the volume of this object, and we also know the density of that liquid that it's falling through, and then the drag force is going to be equal to 6 pi eta rv. Again, we can record the value for the velocity by looking at measuring the time it takes to go through a certain distance. Uh, we know the value of r, the radius of that ball, and therefore the unknown in this equation is a viscosity which can be calculated from dropping uh, ball bearings through a viscous fluid.
So we've been looking at materials which are fluids, but now we can think about materials which are solids. And a great example of this is just a simple spring. And this brings us on to Hooke's law. So with the spring, if you apply a force to it, it's going to extend it. And effectively, the bigger the force applied, the greater that extension. And we find that as we apply a force, it's going to cause a change in extension. And it's related by this constant of proportionality. So K, this stands for the spring stiffness or the spring constant. And effectively, if you double the force applied, we double the extension. So X is the extension, and that's the change in length of that spring. Now with a simple spring, provided we don't extend it too much, we can look at the relationship between the force and the extension of that spring. And what we get is this linear graph here, uh, and this goes back through the origin. Now just by convention, we tend to have force on the y-axis and x, um, the extension on the x-axis. And that means for this graph over here, the gradient is equal to the spring constant. Uh, and this has the units of newtons per metre. And when that spring has been deformed, it's storing energy in the form of elastic strain energy. And this is actually equal to the area underneath that line. And to work out the elastic strain energy, which is E with a little EL underneath it, uh, this is equal to the area under that line, which equals a half F delta X, because it's just the area of that triangle. And this is provided we have elastic behaviour. Behind, we haven't gone beyond this limit of proportionality, where we then have permanent deformation and plastic behaviour. So this is what happens with something which is obeying Hooke's law. But we can also have other materials which don't obey Hooke's law. For example, things like polymeric materials, including rubber. So perhaps with a rubber band, when you're applying a force to it, we get behaviour that looks a bit like this. So this is as we're loading up that material, and then when we take away the force, it kind of goes back to its original shape. And what we might see is actually these two lines aren't quite the same. Now what that means is that effectively the area between these two lines in here, that's related to the increase in energy stored in this system. And effectively, this is why sometimes that if you have something which is deformed many times, especially things like rubber, they tend to increase their thermal store of energy as they start to heat up. So what you might have is you might have the linear behaviour where you've got a spring or a material that is obeying Hooke's law, or maybe you've got a different material where, again, we have the same type of graph, but we're now showing a different type of behaviour. If you actually had to calculate the amount of energy stored in one loading and unloading cycle, what you'd have to do on this graph here is actually count the squares. So these graphs look at certain objects, but we can also look at stress and strain, which are related to the material properties of that substance. Now, stress often has the symbol sigma, and this is related to the force per unit area. Okay, so over here we just have the force. Now we're looking at the force per unit area applied in that material. Now we measure our force in newtons, our area in square metres, and that means the units for stress are pascals, or sometimes we tend to use mega or even gigapascals because we often have very small areas which are being um, having a force applied to. So often we're looking at MPA or GPA for the size of stresses inside materials. When it comes to strain, and that's equal to the change in length over the original length. Okay, so this is our extension over the original length. And because it's a ratio of two numbers, strain is a unitless quantity. So we've got stress and strain, which are quite different things. And if we were to do an experiment, we could actually measure the stress and strain as we deform an object, either extending it or compressing it. And then we get a graph that might look a bit like this. So as the material is deformed, initially we have this linear region where the stress is proportional to the strain. And we can use this to work out what we call the Young modulus of that material. So the Young modulus is equal to the stress divided by the strain. Uh, and this Young modulus, it often has the symbol E. Often it's also called the engineering modulus. So that's just equal to the stress divided by the strain. Now again, because we've got um, the stress measured in pascals and strain is unitless, that means the units for the Young modulus are in pascals. And this is something which is specific to that material. So you might have the Young modulus of steel, and it doesn't depend upon the dimensions of the object that you're actually testing. 
So what we have over here is we have the stress is proportional to the strain until we get to this point over here. And this point over here is what we call the limit of proportionality. But if you keep applying a force, what we find is that we can get up to another limit which is just slightly beyond it. And this is where that material will still go back to its original shape. So just beyond the limit of proportionality, we have the elastic limit. So provided you take away the force, it will go back to its original shape. But what happens if you keep, um, maybe uh, you keep this material under tension and you keep pulling it? Well, we get to a point where it actually starts to yield. And this point here is kind of the highest point on this line over here. And that's what we call the yield point. And effectively, this is where that material fails. It stops behaving in its normal, normal way. If we kept on applying a force, actually what we find is that there's a point where the, stray, the stress drops slightly, but the material starts to extend a lot. And then we get to a point up here um, at a higher stress. And this is the point that we call the UTS, or the ultimate tensile strength. And effectively, that's the maximum stress it can take. And if you go beyond that, what we then get is we get failure. And this point over here, is the breaking stress. So this is a stress strain graph if you have a material all the way up to failure and we can see that um, as it's failing even though there's only a small amount of extra force applied we get a massive strain. Now the other thing uh, which might be worth noting occasionally is that the area underneath this line just like it was the elastic strain energy when we looked at uh, maybe just a spring or something like that now the area under this line on a stress strain graph is equal to the energy stored per unit volume. Now, the final thing, um, we've had a core practical over here. There's another core practical. So core practical three is where you measure the young modulus of a material. Often you use a piece of wire and you can find that by adding a small weight to it, we get uh, quite a small extension which we can measure. We can then calculate the stress and the strain and if you plot those on a graph, we can work out the gradient to find the young modulus for that material. But I cover that in a bit more detail in another video. So that is just a brief summary of the materials module for Edexcel IAL. We're looking at density. We're looking at what happens in liquids and fluids. Where we've got upthrust and Stokes law for falling objects. We then have Hooke's law, uh, which is often to do with springs, maybe other materials. And then we have stress and strain which are properties of that material. And then that leads us to work out how we can calculate the young modulus for a material. So that is Edexcel IAL materials.